Awesome. Yeah, that's something I want to go over too. Not a lot of uh, competitive bodybuilders that are attorneys, <laughs> so that's that's really awesome. Yeah, we are. We're definitely a small group, and uh, there's <laughs> actually I know a couple who are in uh, in medicine, and um, they're not pros yet, but they're they're darn close. At least I know. I think one of them is. I think the last name is Fawn. Tina Fawn. Does that sound familiar to you? And and as a bodybuilder, that sounds so a, hard. A, she's a woman competitor. Um, as a, a, I think as she, a, in bodybuilding though. Um. I don't know if in bodybuilding, I think she's a bikini, but... Yeah, it seems so much more manageable, right, for a bikini yeah. if you're a doctor. I can't imagine, you know, I've got a lot of doctor clients. I can't imagine, you know, that'd be so hard to get your pro card. Um, but thanks, man. I really appreciate you uh, coming on. I've been looking forward to talking to you for a while. Um, I guess for the audience who doesn't know, this is Nick Jackson, uh, IFBB 212 Pro. Um, like I said, I've been following you since before you turned pro. Um, your JD Muscle on Instagram, and what's the JD? Because up until like I don't know a few months ago, I thought that was your name, your nickname or something. Man, look, everyone thinks JD is like my, my my name initials, and so there's been a couple times where I posted on my story like JD. So what it stands for is Juris Doctrine. So that's the law degree that I have. And so oh. when I was thinking of like a catchy Instagram handle, like I changed it um, halfway through when I actually started bodybuilding. Like let's get a catchy instagram name to be like advertisable and promotable and so cali muscle is what came in my head i was like well i can't take cali I'm not <laughs> Cali, and tennessee muscle doesn't sound <laughs> you know doesn't sound pleasurable so i was like oh my i'm an attorney so jd muscle there it is i don't know how they didn't register what that was you know my i my mom's worked for attorneys her whole life and so, but yeah most people probably don't recognize that that's the problem they don't yeah they don't put this together <laughs> I get called JD all the time. So at this point, I just got to answer to it. Like, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, for me, I'm, your nickname could just, you could just take Phil's nickname and just, just be Dream Killer. Because like, like I said, I, I, was, I first saw you, I was getting ready for that, the 2022 Nationals, and I, I was opening my gym at the time, so I had a lot going on. I was like, oh, I don't know. And then I saw you, I was like, fuck. Like, maybe I get that second spot, but I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I've beaten a couple of guys that were, that were supposed to be competitive, and I, I was like, no, nah, I'm just going to wait. I'll, I'll hold on. <laughs> so, so I definitely want to go over your... It would be great to, to have you up there, man. Like that, that class, that 2022 class was stiff. That light heavyweight division was just stiff from... Uh, I mean, I think you I think you were pretty clear, though. I mean, out of everybody, I think you definitely... Like, I think it was tight between everybody else, but I think you were pretty clear ahead. Oh, I really appreciate that. It's like, just one of those things where it's like you get backstage... And you see everybody backstage and everybody's like pumping up and things of that nature. And you start picking things apart. <laughs> and it's like, oh, like his traps and his, his chest and his quads and everything. And so it's so hard to like not uh, blow that up in your own mind and just like be confident in yourself. And so like, well, that's like the biggest misconception, right? People yeah. think bodybuilders are so confident and we're really so <laughs> insecure. Man, it is. It comes in like it comes in like different ways for different people. Like for me. Like, stepping in a gym, like, it is what it is. But, like, competition day, like, that's when that's when the insecurities come out because you have everybody from across the country or across the world who's coming in for tanning and something like that. And it's like, man, they look hella dry right now. Or they are just looking so full right now. And it's like, I haven't had Just whatever coffee. you don't have. Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. <laughs> so you just start picking apart, and then you have to take that time to sit back and take a deep breath and say, look. You know, we're all here, we're all competitors, we're all pros, we're all at nationals or wherever you are. And so just show up and show out as best you can. And you just did your first pro show this year, right? Yeah, yeah, I did the is, New York Pro in May. Is the vibe pretty much similar to like a national level show where it's like competitive and or is it a little more camaraderie? How, how is it at the pro level compared to the, the amateur? Um, I think for me, like it, it felt the same because there was a couple people there who I competed with at nationals. And so being able to see them again and hang out with them again um, backstage and kind of talk about, you know, the, the road to this pro show and competition and stuff like that. Um, I felt like there was a lot more um, camaraderie backstage than in comparison to a national show where everybody's yeah. so tense because everybody wants to get that pro card. Right. And so at the national level, you're just like super tense in the morning and then everybody's super chill in the evening where I felt like at this pro show, especially New York pro being as big as it is, like I feel like everybody was kind of just super chill from morning to the evening. Like there wasn't really any type of tense vibe that I think you would see in a national show just because we all understand we're all pros. And so the next step is get to Olympia. And so, you know, everybody wants to get that Olympia qualification, but it's not, 
it's not like uh, I wouldn't put it in the same comparison as as a national show. And so, yeah. just being That's backstage, super chill, you know, and talking to some of the guys who've been there for a minute and getting advice about you know the road ahead and how many times they've gotten knocked down in pro shows before they got their first call out and that kind of thing. So that was always super cool. What made you? I'm going to actually pull up some picks from that show so people can kind of see what what we're working with. Um, <laughs> what, what made you pick the uh, the New York Pro? So I think the biggest thing was if I wanted to see how I would compare to some of the best in the world. And so being able to um, look at how I stack up against Karen, who, you know, had won the New York Pro the previous year, uh, Olympian, uh, several other guys who are Olympians or darn near close to being Olympians and maybe like one spot away from getting the Olympic qualification. And these guys are from across the world, right? From Poland, from Italy, from Brazil, like all, all across the world, some amazing, amazing competitors. And so, and also it's, it's the, one of the biggest stages for 212. Like 212 division doesn't have a ton of shows to jump into. Yeah. Like we have like maybe like five or six across the year and like half of them are in Europe. It's like, I don't have the funds right now to go travel to Europe and go be in Romania. Like one day I hope <laughs> to be there. I would love to. But at this initial point, you know, being stateside, there's not many to choose from. And so I felt like New York Pro debut, get in front of the judges a little bit and get that extra, extra hard feedback about how you need to improve and then also how you stack up and come out with a bang. You know, don't necessarily try to, you know, win a smaller show and nothing against anyone who wants to start with smaller shows. I, I think that's a great idea. But for me, I wanted to come out to the biggest show, get stand next to some of the best guys in the industry and see how we stack up and then take the feedback and get back to work. Were you next to any of like the top guys when on your initial walkouts, Ole or, or any of them? So we, the initial walkouts, you know, not so much. I was, I was down at the, I think third call out. So, I, but I mean, I like when, you, when they first bring you guys out, right? Like, yeah. Just oh yeah. 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 So we were standing next to each other, uh, along the diagonal and then, uh, a couple of posing rounds and then they did all the call outs and everything okay. like that. So you got, you got to see next to the, the you know, the, the top five or so a little bit just to see. Yeah. The structure yeah. Not only just being next to them, but also just watching them from the side to see yeah. how they pose, how well their conditioning is, all those different things. And so, you know, it was such a, a wonderful opportunity just to get your feet wet and, and get that full experience of being with, you know, top level 212 pros. And you won't really, like, it's not like you're going to get nervous for any other show. I mean, there's really nothing bigger now besides maybe the Olympia, right? They don't even do right. the 12 and the Arnold anymore. So it's like, you're, like you said, you're on the biggest stage, so you got that out of your way. And, like, for people who don't know, like, they see this. And, I mean, you, I mean first of all, you got a, a pretty sick front relax. Like, that's, re that's really, I always am jealous of people who have that just initial front relax that just looks so good. Because that's like, not, not like my strong, and you leave a really good impression there. But people see this, and when they, they hear that you placed, I think, 14th out of, out of 17th, right? They're like, how how does that happen? But it's like you look at seven through fifteen. That margin for error is like I was looking at it, man. Those are so that's so tight. It's not really like that with the open guys. You know, you won't see that that close when, when there's that big of a of distance in the actual placing. So right. were you were you happy with where you placed overall? Or oh, in, oh, I was I was totally excited. So when I came off stage, I knew where we were going to be. I knew it was third call out. I knew, you know, we weren't in that top five. And I think going into it, like. I didn't have these ideas of grandeur, like, oh, we're going to go in, we're going to win our first pro show. Like, I was very, um, had very controlled expectations of going into the show because I understood who was going to be there and how big of a show this was. So being able to be 14th and how I kind of capture it is right there in the middle of the pack. Like, we weren't dead last and we weren't necessarily at the top, but, like, we're right there at 14th. So we have the room to improve. And we were we were competitive enough, and the feedback we got was great. Um, be it you got growing little quads, fill out the lats, your shoulders, um, be a little more crisp in the posing. And so, getting those things all, all, on, on top of conditioning, like just being dry, dry as, as we can, and just dig it out. Like those things are all doable, and things that I'm I'm more than happy to get back to work and do. So, it just kind of. Um, the placing just added to the fire as far as being excited to get back to work. It, it wasn't a fire of, oh, I'm going to show everybody they put me in the wrong place. It was just more so I'm hungry 
to continue to improve, to get better. Not with this adversarial mindset, but just more so if they gave me the constructive and we're going to put that constructive to use and come back with a whole new package. I'm surprised they, I mean, when I look at you, I see, you know, your pecs are super strong. I'm surprised they mentioned quads specifically. I mean, maybe like adductors or stuff. But I feel like your quads are like developed as shit, you know? Like, they just mean like general size from the front or what were they talking about there? So it's more sort of like from the side poses. So you're looking yeah. at that, that side chest, like just a little bit more sweep in there. Oh, can then, you see like, this? Yeah, I, okay, I can okay. see exactly what okay. we're looking at. So okay. we're, we're looking at like just a little more sweep in the quad, a little more hang in the hamstring. Um, I think also just bleed more condition in that side pose. So it, in that photo, I don't know if it's the picture or not, but it looks a little bit soft as far as like the muscle detail in it, at least from my perspective. And so being able to kind of just dig that out just a little bit more so you can like really see the individual muscle fibers when you hit that side pose, not just at the upper chest, but in that lower uh, quad sweep, I think would be uh, exactly what we're looking for. Now, were you working with Blue for this show, or you started work with him afterwards? So we we made the change, or I made the change uh, right after the Fourth of July. So we, I was with my previous coach for this show, and we, I came back uh, maybe at like two or three weeks, and then I was talking to a few friends about, um, you know, going forward, what what we need to think about going forward, and so they're like, maybe you need to research a different direction and vision for a coach. And that was something that um, wasn't initially in my head when we finished the New York Pro, but um, I felt like being at this pro level stage uh, and having a coach like Blue to who understands that pro level and what judges are looking for and has guys who compete at a high level at the pro level stage, uh, having his wisdom and guidance, I think was gonna help me kind of push over the hump a little bit. Um, and getting to that top call out and potentially, you know, first place finishes and you know, qualifying for the Olympia. So what, what made you go towards blue? Cause I mean, I think he's pretty, uh, criminally underrated. I never hear a lot of the, the, a lot of the pros talk about him and he's got, you know, really good track record, right? He, he had King Q, uh, was that 2018? I think he took him to Olympia top yeah. 10. I think he was the last guy to beat Clarita in like a regular show. And then he almost won the, uh, the masters with Phil Lahar. He's doing good stuff with uh, Stu, beef Stu, obviously. Yeah. Um, what, what drew you to him or like, what, what about his coaching style? What made you choose him? So, uh, his, his overall work profile is, is, was the first grab. So I had a friend of mine who reached out to me. I was like, you know, give me a list of coaches that you think are good resources to kind of help me through this next journey. And so blue was the first one that she had mentioned. And so I went to his Instagram and I looked at all his Instagram and all of his guys are conditioned, shredded. <laughs> dug out, shredded. And of course, I, I follow Beef Stew on Instagram. And so seeing him and massive as he is, be as conditioned as he is. Um, and then we had a phone conversation because I reached out to him on uh, through Gmail. And I was like, hey, you know, gave him kind of like my background and everything. And so we had a phone call and he just kind of gave me some real conversation. I really appreciated it. And he just kind of broke down what we need to do, what we can do and what's feasible and what we can do with my physique to get there and all of the things were positive there was never really drawback on the conversation and when i say positive it's, like, it's not he was filling myself yeah. with any hot air like he was just straight this is what you have this is what we can do okay. if you let me guide you and we can get there type of conversation and so that non-bs type of conversation was really drew me to him and then uh, understanding that he doesn't use a lot of diuretics for different people. Yeah. Uh, that was a big draw as well, because we want to stay as healthy as we can through, you know, the short term of our life bodybuilding, because we don't have a long period of time to bodybuild. Like most of us would be done by 45, maybe 46 if we're that lucky. So, you know, in this short span of time, being healthy as we can and understand that he, he is super focused on our health as competitors while also bringing us to our best potential. And so that's what drew me to him. Yeah, I um, I used Blue actually, you know, so I, I competed at a, a just a, a local show I hear and I was getting ready to requalify because I, I ended up not doing that, that nationals that year that you won. And uh, so I was gonna go in and I was gonna go ahead and just slide into uh, like NPC Universe or like right as I turned 35, I was like, I'm just gonna do masters and I'll do. So I just, I went in this show kind of like 
six weeks out from my real show, so I wasn't diced to the bone, but you know, it's a regional show, like I've got pretty good shape and I'm always diced from the front, but uh, there was a guy there who, who was just, I've, I've never seen a more conditioned uh, amateur athlete in my life, even at, na- yeah. even at, even at like na- the national shows. And the, I mean, this guy was just glutes, just stride and more than like Lunsford looking. And then uh, ended up being between me and him. They rejudged us at the night show too, because I really should have had him beat on all accounts. You know, I had a little yeah. bit more muscle, a little better aesthetics, but he just was so diced and uh, he used blue. And like right after that, I called up blue and I was like, all right, let's see if I can, <laughs> if I can bring, bring these out. He ended up winning the overall as a light heavy. So uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I liked blue a lot. I, uh, use them for my off season and I just had a lot of like crazy stuff going on at one point where I kind of needed like a little more attention than I deserve or can get you know from yeah. uh, from somebody like blue so now I'm actually using uh Robin Strand you, you familiar with him yeah yeah. So you, yeah he just he just competed today at the probe so I, I liked him because it's like he's a guy who's not gonna win off a of structure he comes in gnarly and shredded so I figure like that's kind of like what I'm looking for as well someone who can you can do that but I think blue's awesome I would I would love to uh, work with blue again I, I had a really good look to him I like the way he does things you know yeah. um, does he do it pretty similar with you like a little lower fat pretty pretty high carbs yeah yeah so we we're, we're kind of uh, building from the bottom right now and so kind of see how my body responds to uh, different food stimuli and everything like that and so I'm sure as the weeks progress, we'll make some additional changes here and there, but he's really just gathering as much data as he can because the plan is uh, essentially these next six months to grow as much as we possibly can, lean tissue, quality tissue, and then uh, make an idea, kind of map out what the next year is going to look like. So uh, I think right now he's going to kind of just build in the data and um, see how more body responds to carbs and amount of proteins and things of that nature and then just kind of hit the gas from there. Yeah, I think your physique is exactly the kind that will do good with him. I think you were really uh, right on with that. And he's also one of the only coaches, you know, who worked with Hani, which I really like. You know, it's, it's hard to, you know, obviously no one's going to get with Hani. So I, I like right. to be with people that were his disciples. So you, you're, the plans are kind of up in the air. Just going to wait and see kind of how the physique looks. Yeah, yeah. Like, so we will come at the turn of the year. Like, I'll be turning 35 next year. And so um, we kind of tossed around some ideas. Maybe jumping into Masters at one of the uh, pro shows, either Tampa or uh, Detroit, uh, maybe Chicago, uh, maybe New York again. Uh, but that that New York would be prior to me turning 35. Um, so it just kind of just depends on how we look come January, and then we'll kind of map it out. I have a feeling we're going to compete next year. Uh, it's just a matter of when, yeah. and so. It may be, it could be further into the year. I think Tampa is the last two twelve show before the Olympia, and I believe that's in August, or it could be Texas, one of those two in August. Um, but yeah, it's kind of up in the air. And then um, I want to definitely cover every, your whole background, your surgeries and everything. But real quick, so you you have part of your colon, or is in your entire colon removed, or just you entire, colon. entire yeah, colon? Entire colon. Wow. Yeah. So does does that affect your posing or abdominal control at all now? No, not at all. I think. Um, there was an, it like there was concern coming back into competing as far as the aesthetics and just how it's going to look on stage, but as far as app control and things of that nature, like those things are still the same. I can still flex the abs and everything like that. I think um, from what I what I felt from the New York Pro is I just need to train abs a little bit more just to have a little bit more control coming into show, but. Um, as far as being able to hit that, you know, thigh, ab and thigh, like there's no, no constrictions there. Yeah, I saw, I, they didn't have one for the New York Pro when I was online. I went back to the USA's and I saw one. It didn't, didn't look too, too bad at all. Like look pretty good. And I'm, I'm surprised how much progress you made in those two years. I didn't realize, man, you're a, yeah, <laughs> that was, that was a pretty big yeah. jump. <laughs> we, so we, uh, the surgery was in August of 2018. So that was emergency surgery for that. Cause I had a bowel rupture, um, on August 2nd that morning. And now, did so, you have symptoms leading up to this? Were you dealing with like some issues or was this like out of, out of nowhere? So I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis in June of that year. And so I was having issues as far as sleeping and digesting. Um, I couldn't really eat anything because my stomach was consistently hurting. And so I finally went to the gastro, did a colonoscopy and it was like, yeah, it's ulcerative colitis. And so they gave me uh, progesterone and a couple of inflammation meds and it really helped for a while. My, Coming out of June into July, like, I was able to start eating again, get back in the gym. Um, and then just out of nowhere, I had a, had a bowel perforation. And so uh, 
rushed into the ER that afternoon. I was actually at work when the bowel preparation happened. Oh, and so uh, drove myself home and then got to the ER that afternoon and uh, did a CT scan. And they're like, yeah, you have you have so many holes in your colon right now and you have ulcers lining everywhere. Like, we, we've got to rush you. You're at risk of becoming septic. And so um, they rushed me in and they kind of explained it on the way. Like, you have seven months with an ostomy. And, uh, but uh, we'll be able to do a takedown surgery, uh, which the they call it J pouch creation. And so uh, I had two more surgeries after that initial surgery. So my second one was in December of 2018. And then my third one, which was the final takedown surgery was in March, which was 19. And that's so when- wait, wait, I'm sorry, when, when was your first one again? So the first one was in August okay. of 2018. And then four months later, December was the second one. And then three months later, we did the third one in March of 2019. So are you having to use the bag this whole time? Yeah. So in between August and up until March, I had an ostomy and which is interesting to, to take care of and like work out with and sleep with <laughs> and eat with and like all the things that you Damn, have to do crazy. with like normal stuff. So um, after I, I remember like the first week, it was kind of hard to kind of get adjusted to because obviously, you know, no one wakes up one day and wants an ostomy bag. But um, after that first week, like it was it just felt like second nature like we take care of it take care of the skin replace the bag when we need to and just keep it pushing like i wore a uh, an ostomy belt and so it kind of keeps the bag in place and so i would wear that to the gym i wear that to work it's hooked up to like the front where is it like right yeah up? yeah right so here. think of it like you know so your bag is sitting like right here yeah and so the ostomy belt sits around the waist and the bag fits into a pocket in that belt and so it keeps it stationary, so you're not it's not moving around or potentially popping off whenever you're doing any type of physical activity. It also keeps it dry, so if I wanted to go to the pool or something like that, I can jump in the pool without any issue, the bag getting wet, getting soaked or anything. So it was uh, it was definitely a great tool that I found. And um, the kind of going back, the March surgery was when they created the J pouch. And for those who are watching the J pouch, essentially they take a the small intestine. They stretch it down into a J shape, and the bottom of the J connects down to my rectum. And so that's how digestion works for me now. So my small intestine is doing all the work. Is it faster? So um, I actually go to the bathroom a lot more than the actual normal person who has the colon. So because, you know, the colon absorbs water during that final digestion process, right? And so I'm not absorbing any water uh, as far as uh, the small intestine goes, everything just kind of just pushes through. And so I, I come like when I first had, I came out of that surgery in March, I was going to the bathroom like 10, 11 times a day. And then as your body gets used to it and accustomed to the new way that the body functions, it came down to six, seven times a day. Oh, that's that's so, better than me during prep. That's normal. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but what the, the biggest concern is I do lose water during the digestion process going to the bathroom. So I have to make sure I'm intaking water and electrolytes to kind of replenish. So I'm not, you know, getting dehydrated, which again, not a big deal because I'm pounding two gallons of water anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So we're always hydrated. We're always keeping fluids in me. So no real concern there, but um, that's the mm-hmm. only real difference. Does it affect like the nutrition uptake at all? Like, as far no, as no. So, like, the, the stomach is still absorbing everything it needs to from proteins to carbs and everything like that. Um, nothing's getting lost as far as uh, nutrition absorption. Um, and there's no calorie restriction. That was the first thing I actually asked my surgeon after the J pouch was done. I was like, is there a concern about calories? I need to watch this or watch that. So, no, there's no calorie restriction for you. Um, the one thing that we just need to stay away from is processed foods, heavy processed things, which I uh, naturally do anyway with bodybuilding diet and stuff. And so um, the only thing that I've noticed uh, post surgery is I don't digest sweet potatoes very well. Hmm. So my main carb source is jasmine rice. And so that being easier to digest, quicker to digest, um, I kind of stick with that as a carb source. And then spinach. Like leafy greens, like tons of leafy greens, I don't digest well. I can have it maybe one meal, but try to eat it throughout the day, 
not have them. You're good with like nuts and seeds and stuff like that. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's totally fine. good with nuts and seeds, almonds, fruits, uh, any type of proteins, fine. Um, but just those two things, leafy green, like heavy amounts of mm, leafy greens uh, and sweet potatoes, don't uh, sit well as much as they used to. Now, was there something like that you could have done preventively, or like that you said you didn't really get many many warning signs, right? Was there anything that you could have done if you would have known ahead of time? Potentially. Um, I think if I had went to the gastro earlier when I first started issues. So I actually started noticing problems in May of 2018. And the biggest thing I started noticing was I was seeing blood in my stool. And I was like, okay, we clearly have a problem. Like, that's not healthy. <laughs> and so, uh, but for whatever reason, I was like, no, it'll go away. Like, we're fine. We're fine. And I feel like if I had gone to the gastro as soon as I had that, I, as soon as I saw that, I feel like the surgery probably wouldn't have happened. We could have been on a medicine regimen, and then we could have been good to go as far as flare-ups and things of that nature with ulcerative colitis. But honestly, I wouldn't go back and change it. Like yeah. It happened the way it was meant to be. Um, I kind of like not having to take a list of medicines to keep it under control. So you because don't have to take any, any medication now? No, no, no inflammation yeah. medication, no uh, progesterone or anything like that, that kind of steroid or anything like that. So um, the body just kind of works the way it does. I kind of pay attention to it as far as uh, digestion goes. If I'm noticing any pains or anything like that, then I'm reaching out to my doctor like, hey, you know, I have this concern. And then we'll, you know, kind of pay it like uh, pay a little more extra attention. But over the course of was it 2024, so over the course of five years now, um, I've been blessed and I have any real issues uh, come up with the j pouch like no digestion problems, no stomach pains, nothing like that. So I've been blessed. Why do, why do you think that like bodybuilders are so susceptible to this? Because it's like, you know, you got Carlos Jr. I know Sergio's had trouble. Robin had a lot of trouble. I mean, it seems to be like you see or just stomach issues in general, are like a big problem. What, what are your thoughts on yeah. that? I I think it's because we eat so much. I really believe just it has quantity. to be it's quantity of food and we're putting so much stress on our gut and our gut health because we pound down tons and tons of calories. Like you take Carlos, for example, for a guy his size, I can only imagine the calories he has to intake. And just for all of us, like bodybuilders in general, like not just at his size, but even for me, for you yourself, like to keep that muscle mass and the size and then also to increase muscle mass and to continually grow, like calories have to increase. And so we're pushing five, six, seven, some of us 8,000 calories in a day and you're talking about dense protein that our body has to break down, dense amount of carbs that our body has to break down over a course of seven meals, eight meals throughout the day. So I would definitely, without like diving into some deep, deep science behind it, I would bet money that a lot of it stems just from the amount of food that we have to intake. Yeah, and a lot of times it gets worse than prep, but I think that's, you know, there's a lot of other things that come on the table then too. Yeah, yeah. So you're living in, you said you're in Utah now? Yeah. And where, yeah. so tell me, take me back. Where, where are you from originally again? So Memphis, Tennessee. I was born Memphis, in Memphis, uh, born and raised in Memphis. And I moved to Salt Lake in September of 2015. Okay. And so when you were growing up, were you big into sports? Like how'd you start to get into like working out and bodybuilding and that all? So uh, I played high school football, uh, ran play? track. I was a defensive back. And I was like third on the depth chart for running back. Never had to yeah. touch the ball in offense because I yeah. like I focus more on defense. Were you uh, a big football school? Uh, in high school, no. I mean, we so I went to a private school, middle school, and high school. Um, we were a good program. We kind of had some down years, and those down years happened to be my four years of high school. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever correlation to make with that, go ahead and make it. I'm not going to argue with you. But just um, coincidence. <laughs> just coincidence. Pure coincidence. But um, after I finished football in high school, I kind of just kept lifting weights through college, um, going, working out. So what, what, was your, what was your undergrad? So I graduated with a uh, degree in public administration. Uh, it was, there's, so there's two pathways to go through. I went to the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And you can go through the College of Business or Arts and Sciences. And I went to the College of Business. So I had a bunch of econ classes, accounting classes. And so... Um, so I finished with a degree in public admin, and then I went to law school in May of 2015. Uh, no, excuse me, August of 2015. 
And uh, where was that? Wait, was that the too? Back, back in August of 2012. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> timeline: August 2012. I went to law school and then graduated in May of 2015. Yeah. So, were you were you competing at all during this time? You had never done a show or anything. Or were you? So I I started competing in August of 2013. Okay, I, cool. did my, I did my first show, the Knoxville Classic, and um, yeah, 2013, and then the following summer, I did my second show, and then I moved out here to Utah. Were you already competing like open, light, heavy? What were you competing in? Yeah, so I started, so I did the novice, uh, I actually did novice middleweight, was it middleweight, 170, no, light heavy, because I was down to 178, so I was like right at the... Yeah cutoff point for or the beginning point for uh light heavy and so yeah. I, the novice for that I had no idea what i was doing honestly um i had a buddy of mine that first show who kind of gave me his diet that he was using because he was getting ready for a similar show at the same time and so he gave me his protocols and everything like that so that's what i was doing his cardio protocols the lifting everything and i ended up winning the novice division and then novice overall that year and uh, I picked up a coach after that, and then he helped me with my second stint, going back to the Knox Classic to, to do the open light heavy. And I took second to a guy who turned pro that year, Steve Wayne. Uh, oh, yeah, he yeah, had yeah. turned pro that year. And so uh, I took second to him at a regional show, and then he went on the nationals, and you know, rest is history for him. But, uh, and then I moved to Salt Lake, uh, in August, uh, excuse me, in September of 2015, and then met my prior coach in May of 2016, and then started competing here in Salt Lake around the around 2016. So, so you competed like pretty much right after you had graduated uh, from law school. Yeah, yeah. So I, in the midst of law school, I was competing. So I'd do like competitions in the summer, and then like train all year round. Uh, studying and then using weights did you, did you do anything else like just... honestly no <laughs> I mean, law school is so like law school is so time demanding yeah. as far as cases and things of that nature um on saturdays like i'll link up with a few classmates to go watch college football or something like that down at one of the local bars or something but as far as a like, heavy social activity like between waking up to go to the gym and then studying like that was pretty much my life for three years yeah that's that's intense man that's pretty admirable <laughs> And so what is it like competing, like, as you're actually in practicing and, and practicing attorney? Like, how do you balance so, that? Or... Go ahead. Like, put it, no, like, how, like how, how do you balance it? Does it, like, does it ever become, like, an issue? Are you, like, too jacked ever? <laughs> <laughs> so lucky enough, I'm not a litigation attorney. So I'm, I am in-house counsel for a bank here in Salt Lake. And so I work Monday through Friday, like, random occasions. I work on the weekend. And so oh, I got to stop you real quick. You remind me a lot of John Meadows. No colon, working oh. at the banks. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it was very similar. <laughs> so like it was, again, coincidence, you know, not the way, whatever. Kind of map my life off, <laughs> map, my, uh, map out my life to, to uh, mimic his. But, yeah. um, which, you know, shout out and our, our uh, rest in peace to John Meadows. Like, oh, yeah, I, I love John. I met know. him a couple times. He was awesome. Yeah, I love watching all of his videos and his training methods and things. I actually incorporated quite a bit from him, uh, the tips here and there about how he trains from calves to intensity. So uh, he's definitely missing the community, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but so being in-house counsel, like, really creates time to focus on competing and bodybuilding because, like, it's 8 to 5, um, and then I can leave work, go train, do what I need to um, without being too stressed about getting this case done or that case done. It's just, you know, what needs to be done in that eight hour time frame, we'll get that done and then we can focus and relieve stress by going to the gym, then repeat it the next day and then the next day after. So you don't get to bring work home? No. So nice. uh, I, I work from home, um, which is super nice. And then like the schedule is flexible. So if I need to leave or go do something, then. You know, I can go take that time and go do that and get back. But after that, after that five five thirty time hits, I'm like we're done with work, and we can go focus on other things. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, um, have you ever thought about like just giving up that and just going full into bodybuilding? Oh man, um, if if there ever becomes a time where I reach that you know top 
half percent of competitors who, you know, make their full living off competing, then maybe. But I don't have any plan to to give up uh, being an attorney just because, you know, three years of my life to put hard. into that. <laughs> yeah. Like that's a that's a lot of work. And so I want to continue doing it because I enjoy doing it. I love doing it. It's just as much a passion as bodybuilding is. So being able to do both and balance both, like I, I will definitely continue doing it because I know bodybuilding is going to end for me, you know, in maybe I would say 10 years. Uh, I'll finally probably be done competing if my body allows me to continue to compete for 10 years. And so I want to be able to have something to continue to fall back on. And so, being an attorney uh, uh, guarantees me something to fall back on. Yeah, no, no bodybuilders have a fallback as an attorney. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Yeah, you got a sweet setup, and then yeah. you've got a you've got a little a daughter, right? Yeah, a little two year old, and she is she's she's definitely a wild child. I love spending time with her, and so again, being able to be in house, uh, not litigation, because a lot of litigation attorneys, depending on what area of law you focus on, you're looking at you know tons and tons of hours of work throughout yeah. the week not only that but you have to take it home and so family time gets crunched and uh, being able to you know have that family work balance is something that was definitely on my mind when i got out of law school and i understood that i'm going to start a family at some point in my life and so being able to balance it along with bodybuilding like so the, i've i've found a good balance Sometimes it teeters one way or the other, but she definitely, um, we definitely get to spend daddy daughter time a lot. So I, I, I won't ever complain about that. Was, was she born when you turned pro? Yeah. So she actually, she was born in January of 2022. Okay. And I turned yeah. pro in, in December of the same year. And so I had a couple of buddy of mine, uh, buddies of mine say, isn't it how peculiar that you turn pro when your daughter's <laughs> born? I was like, Hey, you know, I'm not. I'm not going to argue about timing, but we'll we'll take it. Yeah, it's motivating, right? Like exactly, so exactly. Do you, how do you like? So I I have you know I have a little girl. She's nine months old. <laughs> yeah. and oh, I, have, wow. I, have a, I have a five year old son too. So it's yeah. like prep as a dad is, can be a little tricky, right? Like um, when she was little and you were getting ready for the uh, the nationals, did you like step? like back at all and have to like kind of take a little time away from being like as hands on, like as you're getting close to the nitty gritty. Cause I mean, that, that's kind of what I have to, you have to a little bit, right? Like yeah, yeah. you got to sleep, there's, you got to. <laughs> there's definitely was um, uh, that feeling of, I'm not giving my all as far as being a dad. And so I had to make peace with that, that uh, it's only for a short time. Like it's not for a full year. It's not for a full, you know, five, eight months, like it's just that short period of time towards the end of prep where the tires kick in, you kind of have to grind through each day, get through each day. And so being able to mentally grasp that and be okay with it, like I was able to do it. Um, it was hard for sure with that first prep being when, when she was born. Um, getting ready for New York Pro was a little bit easier. Um, in the sense of not having that mental stress that I'm not being there for her because we had already gone through it uh, when she was first born. I think um, I put more energy towards the end, trying to be there up until the point where I just didn't have the energy to give anymore. Um, at least I try to anyway, like be as present as I can, be as patient as I can. Hmm. Um, so I think going forward, it's going to be progressively easier because as the older she gets, the more I can explain to her what's going on. Yeah. And so, you know, when she gets five, six, seven years old, I feel like in that time frame, it's going to be even much, it could be that much easier because the communication is going to be better because she's going to understand what I'm saying. I'm going to understand what she's <laughs> saying. And so we can have that back and forth about, you know, why daddy is so tired, why daddy's doing this. And, she have a better understanding of what's happening. And so uh, I won't feel um, as terrible, which I'm still going to have that terrible <laughs> feeling because, you know, I want to be as present in my daughter's life as I can. I want her to be. But it was all me. for her too, you know? Yeah. You know, like I wanted to experience it and I wanted to enjoy dad as he's going through these things and be supportive of dad. And 
but I also want to be able to uh, explain to her why things are happening, what's going on, so she can understand it. Because the more she understands it, the more the better we can be parallel in that journey, instead of you know bumping heads because daddy's not being fun anymore. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's definitely different prepping with kids than not. You know, I had to tell yeah. my guy he wanted to go uh, he wanted to go bowling, and I'm like, man, I'm like five weeks out, buddy. Like I can't, <laughs> I, just, I just can't, I can't go bowling. What some weird happens, you know? Like, right, you know? right. All those <laughs> like, things pop in your head. Yeah. I was like, no, I know my, you know, I'm down. I don't care at all. But I was like, I'm, I'm sorry, but give me five more weeks. Now, are, are, are you with the, uh, with her mom? Or yeah, yeah. So okay. we, we've been married now for, um, it will be four years coming August this year. Okay, so that that helps, you know, because you, you can definitely lean on yeah. her a little bit, and she can like take the load. You know, when I have my son, it's like a hundred percent on me. So I'm trying to be, be there best I can. And then with my daughter, it's like. You know, I do feel pretty pretty guilty. My girl's been <laughs> definitely taking that the heavy load, and she's letting me know, like, okay, as soon as yeah. the show's over, like, yep. <laughs> if you don't win, you ain't, you ain't, you ain't trying to get in this year. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely a balance between the two, and like, I try to be as helpful as I can around the house during those like final like three four weeks. Um, what's nice is like she she's competed before, and she she's done the bodybuilding thing for a while, and so. There's definitely that level of understanding between the two of us about what competition prep looks like, what it, the energy it takes, the time it takes, the sacrifices it takes. Um, but she also, you know, lets me know, you know, we need you here just as much. Yeah. And so we, I want you to be able to be, uh, create that balance, uh, be here, be present, not just physically present, but all present with us. And so those are things I take to heart each time we have those conversations because um, I don't want her to feel like she's ever carrying the bulk of the load when it comes to our little girl, like I wanted to be an equal uh, load share between the two of us. And is it always going to be equal? No, because she's going to gravitate to one of us more than the other. But um, no matter what is going on in our house, like I want to be as helpful as I can be, no matter what it is, be it doing the cleaning or the cooking or, you know, giving her a bath or taking her out and give the, the wife the day off or something like that. Like whatever can be done, you know, that's the balance I try to strike. So are you having, you wanting to have any more kids at all? Is that on your, on your, uh, no, no, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. we, we have our little one. And so it was, it was a process to get her here. So we had to go through IVF for that. Oh, yeah. And so, um, it was, she was definitely our, our blessing, uh, going through that process. And we were blessed enough to only have to go one round of IVF. Yeah. I know a lot of people have to do more than one round. So, yeah. Uh, we were definitely blessed to have her, and she has definitely added a lot of energy to the house, a lot of spunk <laughs> to the house, and a lot more sass in the house. Yeah, so. it's like it. <laughs> it's adorable. Yeah. So, what what made you move out to Salt Lake to begin with? So, um, I was actually I had, I had accepted a job in Lincoln, Nebraska, and I was two weeks from reporting to that job when I got offered to work in the adjudication office for Social Security here in Salt Lake. And so I remember sitting at home in Memphis at my parents' house and I was weighing it out. I was like, Lincoln, Nebraska, Salt Lake City. <laughs> and like, cause I, I visited Lincoln for an in-person interview and it was not impressive. Like no offense <laughs> to anybody who is from Lincoln. I've been to Lincoln many times. There's a, there's a, there's, <laughs> this, there's a this, center for the physical therapy stuff I do there. It's terrible. Yeah. It's terrible. Oh, <laughs> I, I, it was also rainy that day. So it just made it worse. And yeah. so I'm like, all right, I can't, I'll, I told myself I can grudge through this for a year and then we'll move on to something else. But as soon as the, the Salt Lake job came and they offered it to me, I was like, done, let's go to Salt Lake. There's a little bit more things to do in Salt Lake, a little bit more culture in Salt Lake. At least over the years, culture has grown here in Salt Lake. And so by the time I got here, there's a lot more things to do. Um, I had a, a, uh, a friend base already established here. So a buddy of mine from college had moved here prior. And so I knew a few people already. So it just made really good sense from a social standpoint. And then just also from uh, a business standpoint to, to come to Salt Lake. How's the scene? They got like good gyms and good bodybuilding. Yeah. Like yeah. So over the years, it's definitely progressed. So when I first moved here, um, I think, my own personal knowledge was only one type of private gym that was kind of like bodybuilding esque. And then over the course of the last two, three years, it's kind of grown a lot in the private bodybuilding gym scene. So there's quite a few here from Butler's Pro Gym 
to the refinery to Origin Fitness to uh, uh, Hell's Gate. So there's mm-hmm. quite a lot of uh, quality bodybuilding. They, I call them bodybuilding gyms just because that's like a lot of the main clientele that trains there. But lifestyle people train there, like your average person trains there. But um, it's definitely blown up. And the bodybuilding scene has blown up here over the past few years as well. And so it's it's been a, a real joy to see over the course of my time here, the growth in the bodybuilding scene and then also in the gym scene as well. Nice. Yeah, it's so gorgeous up there too. Yeah, oh, the mountains are beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Nice. Um, I'm going to, let's try, I want to, like, one of the things that I like to do on here is, you know, I am um, really big into, like, uh, biomechanics. It's kind of, like, my main thing, I guess. And I yeah. think you've got some really good mechanics. And I think, like, bodybuilders get, this like the weirdest thing in the world has happened over the last I don't know like five or six years. I feel like like bodybuilders have now been told that they do things wrong and that like like exercise science says you have to do it a certain way and you can't be like yeah. intuitive with your body at all. And I think you're a great example of how to actually build your physique using you know right forces of tension. So I'm gonna pull up just a couple of your videos from IG. So like I said, when we look at you, man, you, pecs and quads are just. I mean, obviously, your lats from the front are crazy, too. I didn't have any videos of you doing lat stuff, but I'm, I'm assuming you do pretty good on there. But, like, when we look at your, your legs, we can see those quads are crazy developed. Like you said, maybe they might be looking for a little more of that the adductor thickness. But yeah. I think a lot of that is because of, like, you actually put tension to your quads when you're doing stuff and to your, your pecs when you're doing stuff. Like, let's look at this, for example. You got, what, this 500 freaking pounds right here? <laughs> 500 pounds, yeah. That was so a Memorial Day. <laughs> this, so this is clean. What I love is that you're doing this as a bodybuilder too. You know, you don't have any crazy arch. You're controlling it, just up and down. You're using your pecs still. That is that is awesome. So one thing, like when I'm watching you press, what I see is like protraction, and actually see like rib cage under control. I don't yeah. see you purposely trying to create some like artificial stretch or keep tension like on the muscles. Now, is that something you just have always done like intuitively, or did you have a coach or somebody that kind of told you how to press? So a lot of it came from um, weight training in high school, but I think the the intentional focus has come from just paying attention to some of the other top pros who train. Um, from uh, their coach, like Charles Glass, uh, listening to him, and then a couple other like training coaches that are in the same echelon as Charles Glass. Um, that's really affected my training over the years. Uh, being able to not only when you're pushing heavy weight, but controlling it and really getting that stretch at the top of the movement, contraction, all those different things. And so when I'm training, those are a lot of things that I think about is getting that deep stretch, that hard contraction, especially with chest and legs um, and back. And those like top heavy uh, movements, I really kind of focus, keep the mental part of it into let's keep that stretch. And if the weight has become too heavy where I can't get what I want with it, then I'm, I have no issue of keeping my ego in check. And we'll drop that weight down a little bit and get it more quality uh, reps out of it. And then we'll get back to the heaviness or increase the heaviness as a, as the control gets better. Do you believe, are you pretty big on like mind muscle stuff? Like you want to, you want to be able to yeah, feel it? Yeah. So I remember watching, um, in the early days when I was getting ready to do body or getting the bodybuilding, I was watching a couple of Kai Green series mm-hmm. when he was with, um, very know, verbose. It? <laughs> yes. Um, was it, was it MedRx? I think that's who he was with at the time. Um, and he was, he was, uh, he was doing that series of train with Kai series that he had on YouTube. And he was talking about how, you know, as bodybuilders we're on weightlifters, like there's a difference. And yeah, I remember right. him talking about, the difference between a weightlifter and a bodybuilder. Like the common person would look at us as weightlifters. That's, that's essentially what we do, right? Like we, pick, like we lift weights, but he makes a clear distinction between the two. And when he talks about what a bodybuilder is, what a bodybuilder is, is someone who is looking to break down the muscle at the most maximum resistance possible to get the most results possible. And so that's kind of how I try, I, I frame my training watching those Kai Green videos and kind of keeping that in mind. Like, yes, you know, somebody may curl 55 pounds, but yet with me curling 35 pounds, I'm getting that much more of a stretch. That's a more of a contraction with that 35 than I ever could with the 55. And then once I can get up to a 55 and I can get the same type of control and contraction with the 55 that I did with 35, then I'll do it at that point. But I'm not just going to do it just to say you're doing it. Like, 
there's a thought and there's a process behind each movement that I do and how much weight that I put on. There's always a thought behind it. Yeah, and like I feel like bodybuilders are pretty in tune. Like sometimes we'll see a bodybuilder do a range and it might not be the the most lengthened range on something, but they're gonna do something else to kind of hit that. You don't have to do it all yeah. all in one go. I feel like just because I'm kind of getting in this online space and I've always been, you know, I follow bodybuilders and PT, that's, that's it. So I've never, I'm kind of seeing how like, like, like especially a lot of natty people, especially like they just kind of like write off like bodybuilders <laughs> and like, like, oh, they're tech, they would be better if they, they use a bigger range and did this and that. I'm like, well, yeah. they're, they're keeping tension on the target of muscle. And I, I mean, I think your I think your leg press is a great example on here. There's people who would say that, you know, you need to be turning out your legs so you can get as low as you can possibly get. You see people's butt, you know, come off the pad, but here you're, you're driving through the quads. And I mean, when you look at your quads, they are detailed and dense as shit. So you can see like you're directing tension there. And another, same thing on the, on the, on the pendulum, like, that is really good. And again, you can go deeper. You do things where you hit, you know, full depth, but it's, I feel like you're just directing it really where, where you want to go. Yeah. And I think Are the you... biggest thing with the leg press is uh, keeping my uh, that lower back pressed into the seat and not yeah. lifting the butt up because I feel like um, I've watched a couple mechanic videos where they kind of break down like the actual internal muscle and bone structure. And it's like that tailbone flexes and like when you exactly <laughs> so like i used to do that i used to bring my butt off the seat when i'm doing leg presses and i'll always think like why is my lower back so effing sore like this is ridiculous and then i remember watching a couple of videos of uh from some different pt people on um uh, on instagram i was like oh okay like that's making sense to me and so ever since then i've been focused on keeping my back pressed into the seat and let the legs continue the motion and there's some movements where I do press my knees out to get mm-hmm. deeper with it. But for the most part, like coming in, hitting that parallel and just keeping that tension on the quad and then driving through, squeeze down and then driving through, as some people say, control the negative. Like that's that's where I keep most of my training focus is on leg press and then uh, the pendulum squat as well. Are you are you thinking about your like stack or your rib cage at all? Or is that just kind of a byproduct of keeping tension on the muscles you just... I think it's a byproduct of it. Like a lot of my biggest focus is on the quads. Like that's where my mind is. And I think everything else kind of flows from that initial thought. Like if I can keep my posture and all that where it needs to be to where I can hit my quads the best way, then that's what the posture is going to be. And so I think it's just a byproduct of the focus on the quads and whatever hamstring movement that may be added into it as well. What's your favorite leg movement? Oh man! Um, so at this particular gym that you, the last video is on where I'm squatting, there is a pendulum squat that he has, uh, and I love that. I love that pendulum squat for uh, squat movement. So I love squatting. Uh, it, barbell like, squats. You like this one. So there's another one. Uh, I can't think of the name. It's a. Uh, you know the Rogers. Oh my God! It's, it's going to upset talking, me now. I can't you're talking about the Rogers one. pendulum. Yeah, I think I think the, I think that's exactly the, the, squ- the squat one, not not like yeah. not like this. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, Rod- yeah. the Rogers pendulum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And yeah, so I love squatting movements. Barbell squats are not my strongest movement, but being able to do the Roger the Rogers pendulum uh, allows me to increase weight while also keeping uh, knee flexion, ankle flexion, and a good plot. Keep my lower back straight, and so being able to do that as a squat movement in comparison to barbell keeps my love for squatting right where it needs to be. Do you do like any kind of like mobility training or anything like that? So I've been doing a little bit more of it here lately. So I've been going to uh, my body work person here in Salt Lake. And so a lot of things that she's been teaching me uh, to kind of help with range of motion and mobility, like I've been instituting into my workouts. So be it like shoulder movement, uh, range of motion in my shoulders, uh, she's giving me a couple things for lower back and leg uh, mobility as well. So uh, at the start of each workout, like three or four times a week, maybe like 10, 12 minutes, I'll put uh, some effort into mobility and then jump into the workout after it. Nice. Did you um, did you get to check out any of this Dubai Pro? I did not. I did not. Oh, that's right. You said you did. Yeah, because I was, I was keeping up with USA's. Because they, we, had a, we had a large... Uh, team of utah competitors that went to usa's this year oh yeah and so i was kind of keeping up with everybody's and everybody was doing so that's like like we like we talked about earlier i don't have that part in but 
we both think it was like a little bit of a down class this year, right? Like just yeah, I think um, again the, everybody looked at, like I think everybody looked great as far as uh, this show goes. But I feel like in comparison to prior shows, the um, depth. The depth was a, like a little bit better in prior shows, but that's nothing to take away from anybody no. who competed in the men's bodybuilding division specifically, because they all looked amazing. And shout out to my guy, Dave White. He's here uh, in Salt Lake. Um, he's in, I believe he took top six at USA's in heavy, but he is a guy, man, he trains like nobody's business. Like when you talk about the hardest worker in the room, like that's the name that comes in my head as far as, the Salt Lake bodybuilding community. Like he trains it, he lives it, he lives and breathes it. And so I'm waiting for him to finally crack open, like bust through that door and turn pro because his time is coming. Are you the only he one is, there? So he was the only bodybuilder from. I mean, are you, are you the only pro out in Salt Lake? Uh, no, no. There's several of us bodybuilding pros here. So Seth, Seth Ingeman is a bodybuilding pro here. Um, and there's a couple of classic guys who are pros here. A couple men's physique guys are pros here. We have quite a few bikini girls that are pros here. Um, wellness, Maddie Bagley, uh, who did, I forgot what show she turned pro in, but I believe it was in 2022 when she turned pro. Or was it a year after? One of the, either 2022 or 2023. Uh, women's physique pro, uh, Mary Power. Um, so we have quite a few pros here in Salt Lake, but men's bodybuilding specifically, it's a, it's a smaller number. Yeah. And so uh, I really believe Dave is going to be the next one up. Uh, he just, he works so hard. And for those of us who have had the pleasure of knowing him, when he first started to where he is now, like that progression over some years, man, if you haven't checked him out, like I, I definitely encourage you to. Yeah. Uh, little Dave, I believe, is uh, his Instagram handle. And so <laughs> ironic, ironic. It is ironic. Now, when he first started, it was a little day, but it's definitely irony now. Like, it became ironic. Not little. He is That's not funny. little by any means. And so I am I am so impressed with him, along with any, everyone else in this bodybuilder community here in Salt Lake. Like they just work hard. And I love seeing it from everybody, from our amateurs to our pros. Like we do we do some serious work here. And so I just wanted to give a quick shout out to those guys, along with uh, the bikini contingent ladies, Kylie Fisher, Angeline. Um, oh my gosh, there's a couple others who escaped me right now. Uh, Ash Remington, like all those, did an amazing job. They all looked amazing this weekend. Uh, big shout out to Kiara. She's not here in Salt Lake. She trains out in Vegas, but she turned pro in wellness. Like she looked amazing. And so just want to give a shout out to all those people. Yeah, I got to go double check everything. I just looked at the kind of like the, the overalls and the, and the comparisons. I want to go look at the depth of all the girls' classes and stuff. I always like to see the new wellness girls, you know, see what the yeah. new talent is. It, man, Kiara, she is, her glute, her glutes are ridiculous. Like her glute tie in her hamstrings. There's a thickness in her legs. Like she's she's definitely amazing. Also, real quick, I've got a couple. Uh, Kat Wynn uh, here in uh, in Salt Lake and then also uh, Cam Excel in Cla men's classic uh, physique. Uh, no, yeah, men's class was he looked he's a pro or he just competed at the USA? Just competed at USA, yeah. like all of them yeah. competed at USA, and so now like the names are flowing as yeah. I'm talking. So I just want to give a shout out to all those like amazing Utah competitors because it was it's always a, a pleasure to see Utah represented on some of the big stages. Yeah, you know, I feel like. I feel like wellness is like taking away the booties from uh, figure. I feel like figure gets like I've heard the, I've heard them say like your ass is too big. You're getting downgraded now. Like let's yeah. we can still have a big ass and be a figure. You just have a yeah. little upper body. Yeah. You know. I, I mean, I, I think it. wellness is such a is such a uh, a funny division. And by funny, I don't mean like laughable, but it's just it kind of it's almost like the oxymoron of bodybuilding. Like they, the balance that they look for in physiques is not necessarily what wellness is, right? Like wellness is you want, you know, big legs. Big you'll you'll lose if you're balanced. Right. <laughs> so it's that imbalance that is always interesting to me when you, when you talk about wellness, like big legs, big quads, and then a little muscular upper body, but not too much. Like yeah. you want your legs to overpower the upper a little Sindar. bit. Yes, yes. <laughs> always say you want Clydesdale legs and like <laughs> uh, a figure upper body almost with Clydesdale legs. And so it's always uh, that division is always interesting to watch, definitely at the Olympia level and then also the national level, because uh, it's, it's curious to see how the judges uh, make their uh, decisions on comparisons for people. So what did your girl do? What was her division? Uh, which one? You said you said your girl competed. Oh, uh, yeah. My, my wife was in figure. So she's figure. a figure better. Yeah. 
Okay. So she she was in one in, in the taller class. So my wife is six foot. Oh wow! And so she uh, she was in the taller classes. So for her, like filling out was also yeah, getting muscle on her frame was also the hardest yeah. thing for her because she had to eat a lot and then try to fill out and be conditioned. And so <laughs> yeah, it was always a uh, always a balance for her. Nice. I'm gonna pull up some of the. It's not the best footage, but we got like a little bit of Rubio up here. You ever see this? I haven't seen it, but man, he is. Yeah. I mean, oh no, I lost it. He looks kind of like so weird, though. <laughs> I mean, he looks good, but yeah. it's like, like I mean, I think if he was a little bit drier, a little bit more conditioned, it wouldn't. It look a little more better put together, but yeah. I mean, he is a freaking massive, massive. He's dude. a massive, massive human being. And when I when I watch when I was watching this, it's like it really makes you appreciate how I mean, Williams a stud right now, but it makes you appreciate how good. He was when he was at his peak because it's like here he is competing with you know Beirut and he beat Beirut early in the year. Had a really close one with Nathan, and he yeah. I mean he's probably he's probably like eighty percent of what he was when he was at his best. He was full blown in his arms and legs, and he's still holding his own against these guys. But like looking at this, I'm like man, I don't think I appreciated how good William really was when he was getting seconds and winning the Arnolds. Yeah, he like William was definitely in my top five favorite competitors for me. Uh, as a as a bodybuilder, I loved his aesthetics. I loved his size, um, his balance from top to bottom. And I feel like for him, it's like he has no lower back. It's just lats and yeah. butt. Like that's 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 William Bonac for me. It's like his back is so wide and like he's so dense throughout his back, and then it's just bang glutes. So it's like, where is your lower back? He doesn't have one. You know? I remember Aceto one time described him as a squished Kai. He goes, Kai's already squished. <laughs> he goes, Kai's already squished. So he goes right into his back. Yes, I can definitely understand that comparison because that's exactly what it is. Like, it's definitely a squished guy. Man, they got, they got, Milos got Beirut full blown for this show. I don't know if I've ever seen him look so big. <laughs> this, this looks like, I mean, I think, I think Bonek probably had him a little bit in the detail. But yeah, yeah I mean, that back double is, is gnarly. He really can't. I don't think I've ever seen Beirut look that big. Have you no, seen him much? No, I, I I know a little bit about him, but this is like like my first time taking like a real hard look at him, and he's a, as a again he's a massive massive human being. Like this is big, he's wide, big. yeah, yes, really good side shots. I mean, he's got crazy side shots and side try. Yeah. Man. Yeah, and then that most muscular his delts are so wide. Nathan looks good. I just feel like. Like I've never like Barusa's legs look bigger than Nate's. Barusa just really filled out on this. Yeah. And then there's a couple from uh, all four, and then we'll look at a couple pictures. We'll break it down for a second. But yeah, I mean, if Nexilla came in dice, he could he could have won that for sure. He's got the size. I think the only thing that's just knocking Nexilla is just I think his proportions and how his body just looks aesthetically. Like he. That's, yeah, that's what I say. If he gets leaner, I think that would change. But yeah, yeah. maybe not. <laughs> He's like, no, like, there's no doubt that like, he's just a massive, just a muscle mass, massive person. But I think just, like, looking at him aesthetically in comparison to everyone else up there right now, it's just aesthetics draw you to Bonag and Nathan. And then for him, it's like, oh, no, he's just massive. But it's like, I think it's almost like his arms are, they look smaller to, in comparison to his body as a whole, so it kind of throws off the balance a little bit. Yeah. But again, like he, I think as he gets that conditioning down, maybe that takes away from it, and that's not so much of a focus. But that's the only thing I see when I look at him is just how massive he is, and then just the comparison of body parts. Like his legs are so massive that it almost makes his upper body look so much smaller, which is weird to say <laughs> that his upper body is smaller, but his legs are so huge and so dense. Did you see the show he did last year? Um, he got, he got I only started. saw a couple pictures from that show. Um, I didn't. I didn't actually get a chance to see the walk, actual posing or anything like that. I kind of just saw some stage shots. I think he was a little leaner at that show than he is for this. He definitely put on some size, but oh yeah, he, without a doubt. Like, so you saw you saw that Beirut's one. Yeah. Yeah. So let's look at these these front doubles real quick. Yeah, who do you have winning this front double? You give it to Baruz with that crazy V taper. I would, I would, I would, I would. I think yeah. with because his lat attachments sit almost perfect in comparison to Nathan, because Nathan has high attachments. Yeah. So it makes his torso look that much longer. Um, and I think uh, that taper and that and that front double and the bicep peaks 
I, w- I would give that full pose to him. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I w- I'll put Bonac in second. Yeah. And then uh, as far as like this particular pose down, like I'll put Bonac second and then Nathan third. I mean, Nathan tore his bicep. It's not crazy, but you can't, it is a little bit, you know, noticeable on that one. And then front lap, normally Nathan owns his front lap, but Beirut just looks so full through the pack. so like, full. Yeah. I, I, think, I think Milos is just like, okay, well, you're going to be shredded no matter what. Let's just pump you full of like 1,500 grams of carbs yeah. <laughs> for a couple of days. Like, that is just, that is just crazy. Like, well, this is, this is also his Olympia. You know, he's not going to make the Olympia, so this is like, all the stops, you know, yeah. all in, yeah. yeah. So his that the pecs, that upper chest, and then the way his delts pop forward, and then those yeah. lats, and then the flex down into his quads, like there's it was almost undeniable at that point. His legs have really come up, at least like, at least for this. Man, Bonic Bonic's so dense and hard though. It's yeah. crazy. I um, honestly would give. Oh, this is hard. This is like, yeah, this, this is, is a tough one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, this when you're watching tough. it, I gave it to Beruz, but in this shot, I probably would give it to Bonac on the picture. Yeah. But watching, the, watching it live, I feel like you can see, you know, all the crazy ripples in his hamstrings and stuff, and the delts pop a little bit better. I think I think what's going to put him over in this pose, if, if I was judging it, would it would be the thickness of his hammies. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. He's got... Yeah. Crazy. I mean, he he never he he's got decent quads now, but he always always had crazy hamstrings. Even when yeah. he's getting criticized for his legs a lot, he's not fully in it now. But him and him and Bonnick both have killer side tries. Yeah, yeah. And again, I think the tipping scale, if I was a judge, again would be the hamstrings. Like yeah. the triceps. I mean, each one of them are thick, thick triceps, thick delts, thick chest. Um, I think the squeeze down on the abs are better for Beirut and. Um, Bonac in comparison to Nathan because Nathan looks a little bit soft on that on that ab squeeze there on the on the try, on the side try, a little but overfilled. yeah, yeah. Like I don't know if he if that just kind of like in between. He uh, was a little overfilled for for the whole yeah. for everything, yeah. But um, as far as like again the tricep comparisons, like I can't I can't dissect that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that's equal across the board. Yeah, so good. I have to go down to the lower body. Um, again, I, w- I would give him, I would give it with the glutes and the hammies, like that striation and his glutes there. And then yeah. that drop down on the hang for Beirut is just, is just nasty. Where, if you could, if he could make it to the Olympia, where, where do you think Beirut's my place? Oh man. You think he's top eight? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think do. he's top, top six. Because I would, if I had to give my... I put him with like Rafa. I feel like he's really on the same kind of lane yeah. as Rafa. I feel like they're both potentially top six to eight guys. I would, I would put him, I'll put him like six or seven. Um, because top five, I, w- I would have obviously Lunsford, Walker, Labrada. Um, You're gonna put Labrada over, over Andrew. Ah, <sighs> I, I think I would. I think I would. Um, just watching him this year training and like he just it looks like he's gonna be that much more conditioned with a little bit more size than he did last year and not to take anything for away from andrew like he is gonna look phenomenal um but i think i'll, I'll tip it to labrada to sit above what about nick you got him above nick or what Cause he can, uh, I, no I can no uh-huh. i'll still i'll still have nick above i think he's gonna be even nastier than what he was at new york pro yeah um I still think it's Derek to lose. Um, is what I've I've talked to people about. Is like Lunsford is just. I feel like he's in an echelon all all on his own in this current Olympia run because with his size and his aesthetics, like that's just hard to beat because he has open size with almost a classic look as far as like the tininess of his waist and then just to blow out. Of his so hand. cartoonish. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Like straight action figure type look. So he's taken, like it's almost like you take a basic classic guy, and then you you train him hard. You keep everything tight with the waist. You keep everything with dimensions tight, and you just add pounds and pounds of mass on top of it, and then you pop out Lunsford. Like that's what I feel like Lunsford has done. And so, um, 
I feel like it's his to lose. And the same thing with, I think Seabum's competing again this year. I'm not yeah. 100% on that, but I believe he is. And so I feel like the same thing for Classic. If we're having a conversation about Classic. It would be his to lose. Um, they have to beat themselves for second and third place to potentially jump them. But I don't see that happening. What, what about Samson? Do you have Samson ahead of Nick this year? Uh, mm, I think it's going to be tight. Yeah. Between the two of them. I love Samson. I really do. Like again, he he's one of my favorites. Um, I just love the way he trains. I love his outlook on bodybuilding and that and what he talks about in the different training videos and how he views training. Um, if we're going on if we're going on aesthetics, I'll put him above. If, just, if his we're quads going are on, just so big, I think that's. Yeah. The, I mean, if Nick had a little bit more sweep, I could see him taking him out, but. I, I just think that 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 sweep that Sanson has just draws, you know, yeah. like they, they're going to sit right next to each other. You know oh, what yeah. I mean? Yeah, it's yeah. Gonna, it's going to just show the difference in the waist. I think I think that's that's going to be the, that's going to be the key, right? Is between if we take Andrew and Samson, and you take Labrada and Walker. Aesthetically, I think Samson and and Walker look better because not, not, I mean uh, Samson and Andrew look better because they have such tiny waist. And just massive X frame, like Walker has a little bit of a blocky waist, like not too blocky, but not as tiny as Andrew, not as tiny as Samson, and then Labrada same thing, like not as tiny as Andrew, not as tiny as Samson, but I think that is where like that small distinction comes because all of them have such quality mass, all of them have such quality density that you have to be that nitpicky, right? And so for me, like if I'm going to be nitpicky about it. And from like a, uh, a bodybuilder outside looking in to some of the best Olympians we have, that's where I'll be the nitpickiest, is right at the waist. Like, how does that V taper look? How does that waist look in comparison to quads? Because as we know, like, the smaller your waist can be, the larger everything else looks. And so the larger the quads are going to look, the larger your lats are going to look, the larger your delts are going to look, because everything is contra- uh, uh, compared to how the tiny waist is. So I think that's where the distinction would be, in my opinion, uh, between those four guys is going to be in the waist. And they, they seem to be going that way with judging, too. Yeah. And then they had a – did you see this 21-year-old 212 guy that just competed at Dubai? You didn't see this no, shit? Did, I, okay. did you have a picture of this? Yeah, I, I'll check it out. I, I got the video. So it was a top two with him and Angel, and he, he pushed Angel. Dude's 21 years old. Let me see if I can uh, share this. He uh, didn't thought, quite have the back density, but he he looked good. Is uh, I thought Angel was moving out of two twelve. N- no, I, oh, let me turn that up. No, I don't think he's moving out of two twelve. I think he's okay. doing a little bit of both. But uh, got it. I know because like I know Ole is his you know teammate, right? So he did the, he didn't do two twelve at New York because he wanted him to get the uh, yeah qualification. Yeah. yeah. But uh, no, I mean I don't think he, he he hasn't done super great as the Open. It's hard for these guys, you know. It's like like you you have an aesthetics that could carry you. You know what I mean? Like if you're kind of one of the like squattier, like bulkier looking two twelves, I feel like that that's hard yeah. to translate to open. You got guys like Derek, you know, that got the shape. You know, they they can do it. But can yeah. can you see this guy? Yeah, I can. I see exactly yeah. saying. Yeah. Yeah, check this out. I mean, I feel like two twelve is moving into some aesthetics big time too. They had that guy I who do. got second to Ashkenani uh, Zargella Zagarella, whatever his name is. He looked yeah. really good. Uh, obviously, Keon super aesthetic. You know. And I mean, you've got some crazy aesthetics. I think I think a lot of the uh, in every division that's becoming a bigger thing. But I mean, look at this dude. Look at his delts. I mean, he's he's got clean a clean look. Yeah. Can we can we go back to that side chest? Yeah. Can you, can you... Yeah. It kind of freaks me out when I see somebody this young, this good. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, like, when did you start competing and start doing all this shit? Because how can Man, you look I was like, be like? Yeah, I was like 23, 24. Yeah. Right there. I mean, that's yeah, like gnarly. that belts and that chest. Like, <laughs> yeah. oh my goodness, that is. Yeah. I, honestly, I have, without seeing a scorecard, I would give him this pose. Oh yeah, I give him. I give oh, him the side chest. Him. Yeah, I give him ab and thighs. Um, yeah, because like he's so full in his pants like, compared to Angel. Like that just roundness bubble. I know. This is where he chest. loses it a little bit. Yeah, that that's. I saw him pop up on Bodybuilders Without Boulders, Borders, yeah. and I was just like. You never know when it's somebody new and you see that you're like, okay, is this how they're gonna look on stage? But he looked good. But you, Angel's just so thick in the back. Yeah, yeah. That I think that's where 
Uh, Angel definitely beats him out here uh, in the upper back. I think he's comparable in the hamstrings and glutes. Yeah. Um, but it's just the density of the back where he, where he, where Angel just has that mature muscle uh, yeah. to knock him out with. But he is that future for him is ridiculous. Yeah, it's nuts. Look at that. Look, that's like the rodent looking pose. <laughs> My goodness. Yeah, that's nuts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, twenty one years old. That, that'll be a big two twelve er. Is there any other two twelvers you can think of that you're excited to see? Um, not on the top of my head, honestly, because I, I think um, for me, it's just I want to see what's next for Keon, how he's going to improve from his Olympia win from last year. Um, he's been a lot of fun to watch over the years, going from classic into two twelve. Um, but I think he now has moved the standard of what two twelve is, is supposed to look like. Um, Clarita had it for a minute, and I think now it's Keon is, is carrying the banner now for 212 because he is just his aesthetics are ridiculous in the size and mass he has. Like, He's just like Derek. I mean, him and Derek are yeah. like both the same <laughs> kind of yeah. that, that yeah. insane shape. And so I think for him, it was I think he finally nailed his conditioning at the, at the Texas Pro before he won the Olympia. Uh, was it last year? Was that last year or the year before? Uh, I think that was last year. Yeah. And so him doing the Texas Pro and seeing how well his conditioning was, because he's always had the muscle bellies. Like, he's always had the aesthetic. He's always had the shape. But it was like conditioning was always just like, can we get like – And you saw, you saw it in classic because you saw what yeah. it looked like if he was diced, but with yeah. that size. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so it's like, if we can just get that conditioning just a little bit deeper, like a little bit drier, a little bit harder. And it's funny coming from me because I know for me, like conditioning is always an issue too. Like if I can just get deeper and tighter, like, but same with him. It's like they, that conditioning is just drier, like bone dry. And so I think he finally got it at Texas Pro and then even got better when he won the Olympia. And so it's like, okay, like where, what's the next level for him? For this coming up Olympia, like, are we going to see that much better than what we saw last year yeah. in, in, in that progression? So that's what I'm excited to see for sure. Um, Kareth, I know he got his qualification. He won the Atlanta Pro uh, for 212. And so I'm excited to see what he does. Um, he turned pro uh, as a Masters, right? I think he's one of the only guys who um, turned pro as a Masters. I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's doing so damage. He, he gives me as, hope. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So him coming in with uh, second at the New York Pro this year after winning it prior, uh, the prior year. And so I'm excited to see what he does. Um, but those are kind of like my top two guys I'm paying attention. Of, of course, Ole. Like, I want to see what he does yeah. coming off the New York Pro win. Like, he's how much better he's going to look coming into Olympia. So um, those are kind of the guys I'm kind of paying attention to because those are, in my opinion, like, those are your top guys right there, right? Like, that's – where the 212 class is trending and where it's going. And so that's where I need to be personally. And so that's why I tend to keep up with that. Um, yeah, you, you got to be that's gnarly where, in 212. Yeah. Man. You, that, those yeah. guys, the guys' condition are definitely a level up. You see maybe the top two or three in an open class be in that kind of condition. It's just see all 15 of the 212ers be in. You know? yeah. So a, what, is your, what, what is your ultimate goal? You know, you've, you've, you know, you've done, you've, you're kind of, I mean, do you recognize like this is pretty badass? You got no colon. You're a full time attorney. You're competing as a pro. Like, what is your what's your ultimate goal? Are you looking to get on the Olympia? Are you looking to take home a, a title? What What do you think? Yes. What, would you, what would you like? Um, I think realistically, we can get to the Olympia. Um, I think that's definitely a goal that's achievable. Um, I have enough people in my corner who I trust in their opinion who believe that it's it's doable for me. Like, it's not somebody just blowing hot air yeah. just to say, you know, just to make you feel good. Like these individuals who have shared this with me are some people I truly confide in and feel like they give me the honest, hardcore opinion. And so I think Olympia, we can definitely get there. Um, I would love to win Olympia. I would love to win more, want more than one Olympia before the career is done. And so that that's the next, the next goal is to first, obviously win a pro show. And then, Qualify the Olympia, win an Olympia, maybe win more than one Olympia, and then I can we can call it good. Um, I would love to have the type of longevity that Dexter Jackson had. Like he was like he looked amazing all the way up to his fifth, like fifty, like he was just <laughs> looking 
ridiculously good. And so, and being as healthy, no injuries, nothing like that, no serious injuries that we knew about uh, when it came from him. So having that type of longevity, longevity, I would love to have. Um, but Olympia, like at least one would be the crown jewel on, on my bodybuilding career. It would, it would honestly would make all the sacrifices worth it. Like the pro, like turning pro definitely made things worth it. But I think the next step to really seal the deal for was all this worth it is to, to win a pro show with Olympia. Well, you've got, you know, you got the things that people can't train for, you know, you've got the structure and, and the shape that, you know, I think will carry you a long way. You got the density. So I, I, like I said, I think you got the perfect coach for you now too. So I could, I definitely could see you making it to Olympia next year. Even I don't think that's out of the question, depending on how these shows line up. Is that your goal for yeah. next year is to get on stage? Um, that's the goal. We'll, we'll definitely see, you know, how we're looking. I'm not going to get on stage if we're not going to be competitive. No. Um, and I, I know Blue's not going to put me on stage. If we're I'll not tell you like it is. He told me the opposite of yeah. what he told you. He's like, ah, fuck, I don't know, man. I don't know if we can do this shit. <laughs> so he's, he's very honest. He, he, had a, he had a guy competing at the Masters USA. He goes, nah, man, you can't, you're not going to fucking beat this dude. No, just wait. <laughs> like, all, all right. <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take that brutal honesty all day. Oh, yeah, yeah. definitely. But yeah. Yeah, that, that definitely goal is compete next year. And if if, uh, if the line, if the stars line up to where we compete next year, and we've done that much more of improvement from from, uh, from this year to next year, and Olympia is on the deck, then man, that, I couldn't ask for anything better. I want to ask you one more thing too. I see you post uh, sometimes like a lot, a lot of book stuff. You're a pretty big yeah. reader. I love reading. I yeah, love, love reading. You're very different than the typical bodybuilder, you know. A lot, a lot more in your head. What, what, what's, what's some of the stuff you're reading? Like you're reading nonfiction, fiction stuff. Uh, nonfiction things. I, I dive a lot into uh, the civil rights era, so I, I read a lot of those books just for uh, kind of get different angles. Of you know that. who I'm related to? Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's in my in my family tree. No way. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's awesome. awesome. <laughs> so I'm always like, yeah, I've always been, I've always been on the right side. <laughs> Carry that banner everywhere you go. That's awesome, man. But yeah, yeah. I, I kind of, I, I, I dive into history a lot. I love history. Uh, I get it from my dad. My dad is a, he loves history just as much. And so, um, the one of the last books that I read was Abraham Lincoln's biography. Uh, and then there was Light, I believe, is the name of the book great dive into Abraham Lincoln and uh, not just from a superficial level, but really deep into who he was as a person from how he grew up to his uh, march through politics to the presidency and then dealing with the civil war. And so really great book and read there. Um, I'm reading currently the Prince about Machiavelli. Um, it's actually a reread for me because I, I didn't get a chance to finish it in college. So I'm hoping I'll have the time to finish it now. Mm -hmm. It's a very dry book. Like, I'm already prepared for it. <laughs> uh, but it's it's a great uh, philosophical book on his thoughts of government and things of that nature. So I'm excited to finish that. But, yeah, yeah, I love to read. Nonfiction is usually where I stick with. Yeah. And uh, it really grabs my attention. And so I love those things. That's awesome. Yeah, I like all the historical stuff. I, I did yeah. a really deep dive on JFK, JFK back in the day and <laughs> did all of his, his bios and stuff. Yeah. Oh man, is there anything you want to put out there? Anything you want to cover at all? Um, I think we kind of ran the gambit, and I, I really yeah. love the conversation. Um, all I can say is, for those who don't know much about Salt Lake bodybuilding, it's growing. Uh, there's a lot of great competitors here, women and men, who work very, very hard. Uh, I'm glad to be a part of this community and get a chance to see all these uh, amateurs and. Uh, watch how they work and their progressions over the years. Uh, some people I've known for a long time, like Dave and Cam Excel, like being able to watch them over the years, how much they've improved and mass they put on and the hard work they display uh, it day in and day out. Uh, Beck Busel, Jess Busel, all those ladies, uh, their work over the years to improve. Like there's a lot of quality competitors here. Um, it would, it would take us a longer time for me to name everyone. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if anybody local who watches this, please don't be offended if I didn't say your name specifically. <laughs> um, but these are just people that I have a closer connection with uh, that I've known for a little bit longer. But all of them, everybody's hard, hard workers. And the gyms here are great from dialed in to origin to Butler to the refinery, like just great places to train. So if you ever come to Salt Lake and you want a quality gym to go to, you definitely have your plethora to choose from. And uh, but yeah, that's 
last year. No, I, I, I did not know that. I did not think of. I thought you were kind of like a lone lone ranger out there. <laughs> oh no, no, no. We it's definitely grown over the years. Like from 2015 to 2024, it's definitely exploded as far as the bodybuilding scene, the fitness scene, and so. Are there Mormon bodybuilders? Is that a thing? Yeah, like um, there's definitely those who are still part of the Mormon faith who bodybuild art. Um, they may not be as stringent as mm -hmm. others, but they still hold on their faith and and be as devout as they can be as they pursue their physical fitness and everything like that. And I think that's an amazing thing because from what I understand, like Mormonism is, is very strict in a lot of ways. Yeah. And so to kind of make that um, that sacrifice as far as, you know, adhering to the tenets of your faith while also diving into a passion like bodybuilding or anything fitness, I, I commend them completely. So, uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a growing thing and I definitely recommend and highly recommend anybody just come to Salt Lake and visit and find some of these great gyms, train hard, meet some good people, and, and really experience by, uh, Salt Lake bodybuilding. Nice. Well, man, I appreciate it so much. Um, like I said, I think you definitely bring a lot to the table that's a little different from the typical bodybuilder. So definitely check out JD Muscle on Instagram and uh, definitely keep me up to date. Let's see uh, some update pictures when you're getting getting ready, getting deep in the off season. Yeah, <laughs> definitely will. Definitely coming. will. Yeah, I'll. I'll uh, I think when we get close to like October, November, where we've really been into the trenches with the blue, I'll probably post a lot more check-in photos and not necessarily just post-workout photos, but I'll probably, like I said, probably post a, movie, a few more of those morning check-ins to kind of really give you a, a real deep dive in how we're, how we're progressing over the months. Nice. Well, I'm really excited to see how things go for you, buddy. Thanks a lot. Hey, I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it, man.